thank you for inviting me to speak. It's a pleasure, and thanks for all staying awake. awake. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to give you a definition. I'm going to talk about a disparity between rural and urban, but I think that's a bit bollocks because it's too easy, this binary notion. And then I'm going to go into some depth of a, an example. Um, I'm going to be kind of vague about place because I don't think you need to really kind of be located in a map to be thinking about what we should be thinking about, which is the third theoretics. Um, and then I'm going to go on to the opportunities at the end. I hope that's okay. If it isn't, throw the veg now. Uh, right. Um, so the definition. Uh, so uh, uh, rural graffiti is kind of, it didn't really sit comfortably. So I went for something um, a bit easier, maybe, or maybe a bit harder. Uh, I went for field because I wanted something kind of, anthropogenic and I wanted this was a kind of kick against street art okay so street art you don't get in the countryside because we don't have streets all right so you can't have street art in the rural environment you've got to have something else so I wanted to go for something that kind of pinned people straight there into the what? The wild, the earth, the rural, the kind of place beyond. And so I said, I thought, well, does field work? We'll we'll see. We'll see how it goes in time. Uh, it's probably no good at all. Clearly, graffiti. I'm kind of applying Ursula Frederick's um, open uh, definition because I think that suits us best, and I think we should address this phenomena, this practice this marking, these uh, Jeff's wild signs with this openness of about a performance, about presence. Um, and I'll come on to stratigraphy as well. Um, and then this, of course, is just a reference for the local people. Uh, this is on the Dwarf, Dwarf Estate, which is on Hoy, which we didn't get to see. But this is William Mounsey's graffiti that he placed there in the late 1850s, I think it was. Um, and his was a tag, okay? So he, his tag was what he would do is he would reverse his text. This is something that you find in urban graffiti all the time. Uh, people reversing lettering, using hand styles that you can't read necessarily straightforwardly. Um, and he's actually performing that elsewhere as well. Um, and he's also writing in Persian as well, just to <laughs> confuse and elucidate and, and build a legend, if you like. This is, this is um, field graffiti. So uh, there's a definition for you to rubbish. Um, what about the disparities between the rural and the urban graffiti, between field and, and street? Uh, it's a, I'm, I'm proposing a kind of binary position. It's, that's too simplistic, I know, I realise that. So, but I wanted to, to kind of just look at our our ideas of um, age, for example. Here on the right, um, a doorway in Glasgow. Uh, I think you can probably date it pretty um, easily, um, that you're not going to see a great time depth. We're not necessarily uh, thinking about a, a palimpsest. So in that way, urban graffiti disrupts our archaeological notion of deep time. Um, but field graffiti, we are seeing age and the depth of stratigraphy. And Matt yesterday was talking about stratigraphy, and I'm going to mention stratigraphy in terms of the, the, the build-up, as shown here on the left, of uh, field graffiti. Other disparities come in terms of messages and meanings. Who is this performance for? Who is receiving this? Who is enacting it? Uh, is it? Does it have temporality that is considered um, survival distribution as well? Um, how is it? Is it? Is it living beyond it, its real uh, shelf life? Uh, how is it getting around the world? Are people engaging with with field graffiti, or are they just sticking with the kind of the known? The um, 
they stick in a hashtag, get straight into into Instagram, and you're straight into into urban graffiti. Where is the field graffiti in social media? So, as I said, as you can tell, uh, binary is a little bit too easy. But let's follow that binary thread for a minute longer. I can kill you with PowerPoint if you really want and read all the stuff that's up here. Uh, look at the disparities. You know, it's just shocking. Or it's fantastic in terms of a practitioner who's got a great opportunity because there's massive more to find, clearly, because nobody's tagging field graffiti or rural graffiti. They're just doing urban stuff. It's straightforward. But I wonder actually whether these figures don't necessarily belie survival and destruction of the phenomena. What these figures indicate is global travel today. Everyone goes to a city. Everyone goes to Barcelona on holiday. They don't go up into the country between Barcelona and Girona and go and see the um, the hotel that was built for the 1982 Olympics for the Argentinian football team who stayed there and then Max Repo, the graffiti artist, went and painted on it in huge letters the word historic. Okay? But look up Max Repo and you'll see that. People don't go and see that. They just go to Barcelona and they start snapping all of the all of the street art there as well. And that's where these figures are coming from, I think. It's uh, global travel as much as anything. So is it, is it a disparity? Yes, it is in social media terms, certainly. OK, let's have a think a little bit more about um, field graffiti and what we mean by it and, and some examples. Uh, this is a, uh, a really nice, simple Georgian text, serif, uh, carved into a coin of a church. Um, it's possibly the initials of the mason, and I'm not including mason's marks in field graffiti. They are mason's marks of something very different. Um, but this is somebody, somebody's tag. These are straightforward letters that indicate the person was there. They may be testing a chisel, they may be sharpening a chisel as well, but they are still leaving a permanent message <coughs> and a mark as well. This is a window in Croik Church. Some of you may well know it. It's just off the A9 as you drive up here near Bonner Bridge. Um, and it, the, the etchings on the windows are a memorial to the clearance of the glens around Croik Church and the people from moved into the churchyard whilst they were being cleared as well. And the church warden inscribed that event on the windows of the church there as well. This is field graffiti. Uh, we, have, um, we have writing as well. We have uh, complex events. And we'll see more of these as well. This is a great one. I like this. Aeroplane landed at Chapeltown, July 1931, and there's a dialogue going on here, there's a performance going on here, there's a conversation, because somebody else has written on it afterwards, it got up again, <laughs> which is good. Uh, Jim was there in 1990 in Arbogliff, so we're seeing different practices, different messages, different meanings, different uh, ways in which the, the graffiti is, is uh, occurring. And this is a more recent occurrence. This is people um, spelling out their names on hillsides using stones as well. Um, and I also remember over near the Commando Monument on the road over to Fort William, I can't remember the place itself, um, Spinbridge? Spinbridge, I reckon. Uh, the Canadians have been there because they're putting up their little uh, Canadian symbols as well. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name. Maybe a Canadian can, can remind me of that. But where people are performing an enactment of, they are tagging not only an individual names and initials, but they're also enacting a nation visiting as well. <coughs> and of course we have the socio-political, the, the political changes that are going on in Scotland. This is um, being played out across the countryside. Um, 
Indiref 1 uh, was a significant shift in uh, Scottish field graffiti. We are seeing it across the country. But that does actually have a history that harks back into um, the pre Indiref in 1979 that happened here in Scotland when there was an opportunity to, as to see to whether we would have an independence referendum. And there is graffiti that we have found in locations, historic locations, that has been preserved by the uh, lead, lead body of the heritage uh, sector in Scotland has been preserved. Whether this kind of stuff has been preserved, I don't know, I'll have to talk to some colleagues. And of course, for the, uh, for the impaired or for the for a broader audience, we're seeing, um, we're seeing um, signing as well. So we're, we're, field graffiti is, is, is really broad. And of course, this is Paul Fail, the final image there, that is the artistic intervention at um, Polfeo, which is a, the abandoned village over on the west coast. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so what is the potential? Well, the potential is clearly that we have a substantial corpus of evidence. What are the, the th theoretical opportunities then that we should be considering? Um, I've kind of flipped them up here as well. I'm sure there are many more that we can, be, we can discuss and introduce. Um, the glocal, of course, whether that's a word that we kind of were playing with and using or whether it's been removed already. So um, the final point on there, the reflective heritage practice. Is this such a good idea? Um, I put that in because, as you'll see from the example, some of this stuff is really raw and really personal, and whether we as heritage professionals should be engaging with it or how we engage with it, we have to consider as well. Okay, let's move on to my example. This is Scallon Mill. Um, I don't think it's particularly important that you know where Scallon Mill is. I think what's important is that you know it's in a rural environment. Um, it's a 19th century mill. There are actually two mills there as well. And what I want to do is I want to demonstrate the, the complexity, the depth, the breadth, and, the, and the, the panoply of messages and meanings that can be found in a rural uh, field graffiti site. So here it is. Um, it's slightly complicated because Scallon is actually has a, um, a formal narrative that it's a Catholic seminary, that it was hidden away in the Cairngorms and it was, a, it was a place where men were made priests as well through a obvious, an obvious period of, of Scotland's history, which is why it was hidden away as well. And so, it, and so we have a really good history of Scallon from uh, yeah, 1717 to 1779, about then, um, when after 1779 the seminary was abandoned. But the additional, alternate, complementary narrative of Scallon is that it was a farm. And it had been a farm probably all the way through it being a seminary as well. So what the graffiti does is it raises our understanding of this alternative narrative of Scallon and puts it on a similar footing as the traditional narrative of the site. Here it is today, looking very pretty. Uh, it always looks like that, honestly. Um, so what you've got, uh, straightforward, the seminary house with the chapel upstairs, um, the south mill down here with its external wheel, uh, the lade runs through, comes across there, into here, along here, and there's another mill wheel in this barn as well. And then this is a, it's a barn, there's a mill, it has a thrashing mill still in place, and there's a stable built on the back of it. Um, and importantly, <laughs> really importantly for survival, it's got a roof on it as well. And that makes a major difference in terms of engaging with field graffiti, as you'll see. 
So, what do we do here? Well, I'll just actually run through before that. The farm was abandoned in the 1960s, and we have evidence of that abandonment. Post-abandonment, five minutes. Gosh, right, okay, that's boring, I'll go on. Uh, okay, right, let's have a, let's have a look at the, some of this graffiti and uh, get a feel for that. Um, so, the Royal Commission, as it was, did a survey of the buildings. They took one photograph of the, of the graffiti, and that was it. We went and visited the place. We were doing another survey there, and we just popped in, called in, had a look at it, and is that working? And came across this room. This is what we think is the sack room. You can see the fixtures and fittings surviving. This is unusual in itself, but concentrate on kind of this area in here, and look at the depth of this graffiti. There is absolutely masses of it. The whole of the interior of this building is drawn and written all over. So I'm going to very quickly go through uh, what we're looking at. Um, this is evidence of a poor harvest. Um, this is basically a columnar spreadsheet from about 1927 to 1935. Um, there's some of the detail. This is the the this is the the everyday, the quotidian of what's going on in this farm. You contrast that with the um, uh, the, the the global impact. This is Jim Grant, who somewhere on this door it talks of him being posted to Amritsar to different places. This is global Scallon. We have uh, on another door a a proxy climate record, week on week of information about what is going on here, whether that's the same as happens across the, the, the area, whether it contradicts the, the narrative of the, the climate, and it also brings in, uh, Steph's, um, seasonality as well. So, this is moving on slowly. Uh, trysts. Trysts, are they true or are, are they alternative? There's a great one here about somebody getting married Okay, just over here. Uh, so and so gets ma is getting married to so and so. No, he didn't, because his relatives are still alive, and they s told me he never did get married. We don't know what happened. So, and finally, uh, very hard to see, but it's been transcribed by one of the relatives of the person who played in this cricket match. This is in the stable door. They opened the stable and you would look out onto a piece of ground that was flat enough, and Tom and Tool played Glenlivet at cricket, and we luckily have the scores here as well. Finally, in terms of the detail, animals. We have a whole range, thank you, two, a whole range of these animals. You can make them out for yourselves. Lots of pigs, quite weird. There weren't any pigs farmed at Scallon, as far as we know. Is this a reference to the Catholic seminary? Not sure, not going to go there today. So, okay, Scallon's quotidian field of graffiti, and I'll run through all of that. There you go, that's just me repeating myself, basically. And there were loads of other images as well in there. Uh, bicycles, thistles, people's devils as well. The methodological and analytical approaches, um, I posted a thing on, on, uh, on Twitter this morning, kind of disrupting this idea of how do we engage with graffiti rather than recording it really slowly and methodically, should we just take a time lapse of us uh, filming it and just walk away? Well no, we've taken some high res images and now that this is part of an HLF landscape partnership scheme, we're going to give their partners, all of the images, so they can start transcribing the information. We can also use um, things like de-stretch um, image manipulation to pull out um, some auto extraction of the, of the information as well, coming out from those high-res images. Right, so to finish, uh, oh, is that on backwards? No, there we go. So to finish, the evidence by which the rural everyday was navigated and performed, this is what we know. But we also know the representation of routine practices and also from other 
field graffiti, we have the creative responses to institutional strategies, the Scottish independence graffiti. Can we think about desertos every day and does that work in, he was talking about the urban I think a lot of the time, but can we play that cross into the, time's up, nearly there, can we play that into the field graffiti, into the, into the rural environment? Field graffiti presents us with a corpus of quotidian evidence that is cross-temporal, has been largely ignored, and where we start looking isn't very f hard to find. I hope that we can start to expand the corpus and our engagements with the body of evidence. How does field graffiti enable us to consider significance issues as well? And then the ethics and, the, and, the gra and graffiti. Let's be reflective. Let's think about, oh, sorry. Let's think about who wrote this, who are they related to. They probably had relatives still in Tom and Tool, Glen River area. We're going to hopefully work with them in the partnership project as well. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.